go up. There was sage brush in, in our way, but it was Sandy and, and um, Sean. And you know, I want all of our listeners to visualize this because I really want to um, have a painter see the, the, the visual, which, which, which brings me to tears every time I think of this visual is you have an American FBI force team and they're all, you know, fully armed. And, um, and then you have two Americans, Sean and Sandy, a married couple, and they're holding hands. And so, um, Sean's left hand is holding Sandy's right hand. And Sandy is, I believe, holding um, Lavoie Finnicum's Bible in her left hand. And Sean, in his right hand, is holding the American flag up. And so they're walking up as a couple with the American flag surrendering to American FBI agents for sticking up for fellow American ranchers, the Hammonds. And so when I look at that photo in my mind and I see and I see our American law you know basically pointing guns at our Americans for being American it, it's really heartbreaking so yeah that's powerful I mean it's an image we should never see we should never have to see and so really you have civilians engaged in in peaceful protests just saying hey we just want the government to follow the law and and then you have them surrounded with essentially tacked out military forces that are ready to shoot them if they move wrong as they march out, you know, with their heads held high, carrying an American flag. Yes. So that was um, just really sad to me because, you know, the, the torture that they went through um, and then, you know, come to, you know, so they, they, they were the first ones out. They put handcuffs on him. They put him in separate vehicles and they drove him up to, they moved the bear cat. They took Graham and I, and they took the bear cat around to the top of that hill where they were walking up. And then they got Jeff to come out and Jeff was holding a flag and, and, and his hand up and they put him in cuffs and they put him in another car and they drove him up. So they let all three of them out and Graham and I um, embraced them. And I want you to visualize all three of them were handcuffed with their hands in front of them. So when I approached Sandy, right. she lifted her hands up. So I kind of went under her arms. So then she could hug me like a bear hug because her hands were handcuffed. And I hugged her and and I told her I wouldn't leave her. And I told her I'd see her in court um, because that's, you know, that's our next battleground. And um, we did that um, with Sean and Jeff as well. And... Uh, and Graham, he's a big guy. Like, so his hug, like totally engulfs your body. Right. So, <laughs> so yeah. So he hugged all of them. And then, um, we all knelt down on the floor and that's an image, the aerial, there's an aerial image of that on the internet. And I'll email that to you okay. where you see Graham and I, and those three kneeling down on the floor. And, um, and it was pretty, it was pretty powerful. Then, um, now I'm, I'm, I'm not on the FBI phone with David Fry. You and Chris Ann was talking to David Fry from right. the live stream. All of a sudden, the FBI, one of the FBI negotiators of the phone says, Michelle, David Fry um, wants to talk to you. He's not coming out. So I, I get on the phone. I'm like, David, what's going on? And then we started talking to him about his grievances and and then since I had Sean and Sandy and Jeff right there, I put Sandy on the phone with David and Sandy was, you know, saying, you know, David, we're the fabulous four and we made a pack and they were really nice and they weren't mean and they were kind and gentle and Michelle and Graham is here. And so, so Sandy spoke with him for a few minutes and then we put the phone up to Sean's ear and we put the phone up to Jeff's ear and Graham spoke to him for a few minutes. And so as you and Chris Ann is talking to him live stream, the five of us are talking to him on the telephone. And at the same time, Mike Arnold and Shelly Shelton, John Moore and um, Heather Scott, and Judy Boyles and our other um, legislators are down at this place called the Narrows listening in live stream 
Well, Mike Arnold, I have to tell you, you got to meet that guy. It's Ammon Bundy's attorney, and the guy is like a superhero, energizer, just running everywhere. So Mike, right. you know, runs to a phone, gets Ammon, gets the prison guard to get Ammon on the phone, tells Ammon what's happening in like a minute, gets Ammon to record a message <laughs> to David Fry. Then Mike runs up to like the first, you know, block of cops and he's like, we got to get this message up there. Well, they don't do anything. So then Mike texts the message to the FBI guy that he was working with the night before because the four and a half or five hours, I don't even remember how long we were on the phone together, Cap, uh, Gavin, you and I and, and the guys. But at the same time, Mike Arnold was on the phone with the FBI and negotiating and doing all of that and then telling me what we were allowed to do and what we weren't allowed to do. So Mike right. texts that message. Mike Arnold texts Ammon Bundy's message to one of the negotiators, and um, the negotiator then gives it to, to gets it to Mark either through Mark's phone or through another text message or whatever it was. So um, I'm talking to David a, a little bit more. We're going through his grievances. I'm basically explaining to him, you know, my own personal story about why I have the same grievances. And um, and then Mark, the negotiator, um, tells David Fry, you know, something about a message. And I don't get to hear all the words from Ammon Bundy, but I know Ammon's voice. Right. And so he played that, that, um, message whatever it was on the loudspeaker right to right. david fry excellent and i and just so i want you to imagine how many hands that was in i mean mike arnold runs gets ammon on the phone from jail records his message on on his iphone from from another right. iphone on speaker so he gets lissa lissa casey which is ammon's other attorney so they have their iphone one's on speaker one's recording it they get right. it to where it's recorded and they get it recorded good enough to text it to the <laughs> FBI guys for the FBI guys to then play it on their speaker on the loudspeaker. Well, and that's a powerful thing. Mike, Mike was really, uh, really a dynamo, it sounds like, in the background. And well, we know that to be the case because not only was he doing that, he was also talking to us in the background, trying to get us the same file. So, yeah. it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he was, he, was, he was really on the move with his. And, and you know, look, we got to use whatever technology and abilities we can to get the message through but i think this really resonates too first of all and this may be just my opinion to me the fbi at this point went along with this because they had no choice there was too much publicity there was too many people watching and so you know the call comes through i mean they can't not play the call but really this really reaffirms the fbi never negotiated this situation really it was always the patriots you know it was it was mike arnold working in the background it was the call from ammon it was the people that without without fancy professional negotiators or without politics or anything like that we just the people carry the message, and at the end, that final call from Ammon really uh, cinched the deal. It sounds like. I, I, you know, I really have to tell you, I, I, th I believe so. And you know, just the legislators, I, I got to tell you, all of us that were there, elected officials, we never felt more uncomfortable um, being in a state than we did in Oregon. And I've got Tony Shelton here with me. I don't know how much time we have, but we're as fine. he was. Yeah as he was driving through burns this is something that you, this is breaking because we haven't told anybody this at all yet so so i'm gonna i'm gonna let tony tell this story because this awesome. is very telling well um so this is tony shelton assemblywoman shelly shelton's husband and and shelly shelton tony shelton and john moore assemblyman john moore were all driving in tony's suv get back well, to portland well we were they were driving from nevada to Portland, and they had to go through Burns, right? We went through Burns. Yeah, they correct. went through gotcha. Burns. Okay, so, so we got the picture. they were going through Burns on Wednesday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, because they were meeting me in Portland Wednesday at 8 gotcha. p.m. Okay, okay. So now, here's, so now they're driving through Burns, and guess what happens to these elected officials at 2 p.m. in Burns before the FBI goes in and starts uh, doing their, their shenanigans? Here's Tony. So I'm driving along 
uh, like I normally do at Nevada speeds. We have normal speeds from the 2000s in Nevada as opposed to the 1975 speeds that they have in Oregon. <laughs> and um, so I got my first ticket in over 100,000 miles. And um, a couple of things to notice is we, uh, when we got stopped, uh, Gavin, we've learned a lot from your videos. Uh, the very first thing that we were asked was, uh, where are you coming from? And I didn't answer. And the next thing was asked is, uh, uh, where are you going? Are you going into Burns? What's in Burns? And I said, I don't know. You live here. You tell me. And so I, I was not going to give any of that information out. Um, I was just, I just tell gave him camera. my. This is uh, tell, what, yeah. Oh yeah, we'll get we'll get there. Okay. She, I wasn't going to give any information out, but John Moore thought that we could just be on our way. He told him we're two legislators from Nevada and we're coming up here to help with the negotiations. And um, I, I'm not sure what all he told him, but uh, they knew that we were two negotiate or two. They knew that there were two uh, two elected officials from Nevada in the vehicle. Um, so he gave me my ticket, my $270 ticket. Uh, it's my at uh, 270 and 100,000 miles, I, I can deal with that. But um, <laughs> the one thing that I did notice, the very first thing he told me before he started talking was, I have to notify you that you are being recorded. That was the very first thing. And this was the Oregon State Police. Right. So the saying, Oregon State Police has body cams. Right. So right. Where as, are they? Uh, as, as the, we, yeah, I see what you're, where you're going with this. Okay, continue. So anyway, uh, so they did have body cams from there. We went and we gave John a tour. We had already been up there once. And so we gave John a tour of the area. So that John has 24 years in the military. He has, he's been in Iraq. He's done, he's done lots of ambushes. So he said, I want to see everything involved. I want to know everything that I want to know the layout of the land. So we drove around, we showed him. Most people don't understand um, this wildlife refuge is 30 miles from the from the town of burns and it's 30 miles of two long stretches of almost 15 miles each that have anywhere along the way they could have stopped these guys anywhere along right. the way but they chose the path that they took and so john was very concerned as to why as many times as they went in and out of the refuge why didn't they why did they choose to do this number one where there's no cell signal number two where there's no trees I mean, where there's uh, all kinds of trees and things like that. And number three, where uh, there, there wouldn't be any possibility of any media. So we right. showed him that. We took him up to where Lavoie was killed. We spent about 45 minutes of him walking around the area. And uh, maybe you can talk to John to get a little more information on that. Um, we, uh, we actually had some wrong ideas uh, about where things were you know, where they may have staged and things like that. But John had a very, very good idea. Right. But if, to give you an idea how hectic it was, we decided to go to John Day, and we were thinking about talking to the sheriff, but we decided not to and went up the northern way to Portland, which is nothing but hills and mountains and no, no signal whatsoever, no phone signals at all, for about maybe two hours. And um, we were about two and a half hours or maybe three hours out of there when we – our phone finally got a signal and we heard what was going on back at the refuge. So we listened to you live for about 20 minutes in some town in the middle of nowhere. And then we decided we've got to turn around and go back. Cause at this point, Michelle is coming from Portland. So right. we plan on coming and meeting her. So we turned around and we came back as fast as we could. Um, we got into Burns at about midnight and there were no hotels because the private